Let's now, uh, as you're able, please stand and turn in your order of worship to hear God's call to worship him. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouths shall declare your praise. Amen. And please remain standing for our first hymn. And will you turn to page 372 in your bulletin for our first hymn. (laughs) Our God reigns. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, good news, announcing peace, proclaiming news of happiness. Our God reigns, our God reigns. the cares and concerns and particular uh, prayer requests, I'm uh, not uh, sure if I'm at liberty to say anything uh, specific about any of them, so uh, that doesn't make our uh, prayer here corporately together this Sunday morning any less legitimate, of course, because God always knows the needs, whether we name them or not, but just uh, suffice to say there are uh, the normal amount of of, uh, of cares and concerns, and probably uh, probably more. Uh, one thing uh, I'm fairly confident in saying is that uh, Deanna Hudgens uh, reports that Fred is doing uh, as well, uh, maybe even better than you might expect, just uh, experiencing some uh, lethargy, some tiredness in the course of uh, treatment. And I believe our brother, uh, R.B. Lyon, either just had a surgery or has, has uh, one coming up this week, and I'm going to call him as soon as we conclude here because I... Uh, not uh, clear on the date, but uh, I know RV was going to undergo surgery and hopefully has not uh, already at the close uh, of this past week. With, uh, with these and many other prayer concerns, let's now uh, go, go before our Father's throne of grace, uh, thanking him for our tithes and offering, but also interceding uh, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Gracious God, we thank you that uh, though uh, life is far from anything close to ideal. We thank you still for uh, the religious freedom to uh, be able to practice, to do everything that any Christian church would ever love to do, to uh, hear your word, to offer uh, prayers, to uh, behold and partake of your body and blood by faith spiritually. 
Lord, uh, we thank you for uh, the religious freedom afforded us uh, in this country. And though we might groan and grumble and think of uh, what uh, perfect uh, life would be, uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, what we have been granted. Lord, uh, in that vein, we pray for our local and national leaders. Lord, we know that uh, our times are in your hands, that our, uh, our rulers and authorities are in your hands, and that you have placed them, and whether we uh, like them or not is really uh, irrelevant to our call and our duty to pray for them, to pray uh, that they would find wisdom. Lord, you do offer common grace to all people. All people are not nearly as bad as they could be because you are gracious in a way to all people. And so, Lord, we rely on that. Lord, we enjoy uh, many, many wonderful blessings from people who are not Christians. And so, Lord, we uh, ask that that be true of our leaders. Lord, we ask that they would make uh, decisions in accord with things that are right and things that are true, things that are just, things that are kind and compassionate. Lord, we pray for our leaders. Lord, we pray for uh, all those in our church and all those uh, outside of our church who are teaching in a frustrating environment. We pray for uh, school administrators who are uh, placed in a nearly impossible situation to do, uh, to do something that is satisfactory and pleasing to everyone. We pray for the children of our church who are asked to learn uh, at home staring at a computer screen. Lord, we pray for our firefighters as they put themselves in harm's way to protect property and others. Lord, we pray for our military personnel. Lord, that you would keep them out of harm's way. Lord, we pray for all of those in our congregation that I mentioned and the many more that I was not at liberty to mention and the many more that we just simply aren't aware of. Lord, who are facing uh, dire, difficult, frustrating, annoying health concerns. Lord, we often pray that the physical health concerns are not usually uh, the thing that we're really praying for. But those physical health concerns can often become the occasion for spiritual and mental psychological battles. Lord, we begin to uh, believe the lies of the evil one as we're homebound, as we're hurting, we're prone to believe the lie of the devil that our lives aren't worth anything, that we're not doing anything worthwhile, that perhaps uh, you don't love us uh, as much as we hear that you do. Lord, may our physical maladies never uh, spill over into our spiritual life, our thought life. May we uh, guard against by faith have the shield of faith to extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. Lord, we thank you for uh, sustaining this church financially. Lord, we thank you for our tithes and offerings. We thank you that we have a, a church family here that takes uh, giving seriously, who gives uh, by faith as unto the Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we bring all these requests to you and the words you taught your disciples to pray, saying... Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. And amen. And I want to put in one final plug. The human, the American false god, the false idol that we are all most prone to, is to believe that if we only had more time and more money, we could solve just about any problem with more time and money. 
there could not be a less Christian way of thinking. Instead, uh, what we should do with our fears and our tears and our anxiety is pray them. That is the biblical example in the Psalms, to pray our tears and pray our fears. And so please remember to pick up one of these sheets. And as a church family, though we're distant, though we're separated spiritually, we are one uh, praying for the cares and concerns of our nation, our church, and our world. Uh, So please, uh, as you exit, uh, grab one of these prayer sheets. Thank you. Good morning. Our text this morning once again as we continue to work through the spiritual armor that God commands us to adorn ourselves with is from Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And we'll read through that passage again this morning together. He who has ears to hear, let him hear, for this is the word of the Lord. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So far the reading of God's word, would you join me in prayer? Our Father and our God, thank you. Thank you for the truth and the strength of your word, that it has no expiration date. It is unaffected by the whims of this world. It is unblemished by the corruption of man. It is the word that we can come to and hear you speak to us clearly to know that in all circumstances, your sovereignty reigns over all things and that you have already equipped us in Christ Jesus with the truth to be sustained throughout our lives and to serve you as your children. We thank you for this time together. The fellowship is such a sweet gift. Uh, Father, as we gather together now as a church family, we all sit under your word and desire to be teached, to, to be taught uh, your truth alone. And for that purpose, Father, I ask that you would please bless my thoughts and words, that they may glorify you alone, and that they may feed your sheep. In Christ's name, amen. Shoes. Shoes are, are one of those things that over out throughout time have kind of changed in their status. At the time that uh, Paul was writing this, uh, they were more of a luxury. Not everybody had shoes. Um, and of course now we've moved throughout time to a time where uh, they're not at all a luxury item. They're, in fact, there's very few of us sitting here, if any, that don't have multiple pair of shoes. Uh, Imelda Marcos joke here. Uh, <laughs> I, I did I did do some research and found out that uh, sales of men's shoes has been booming over the last decade. It's still only a couple billion behind the sales of women's shoes. <laughs> but we have shoes for every purpose, don't we? 
Uh, some we just use to exercise in. Uh, some are, are designated for work. Others are for comfort. Uh, some maybe to make a, a fashion statement, uh, to go with a particular outfit. Um, shoes have all kinds of, I don't know, my I household, and I think I, my household's pretty different, uh, there's one of us, and I'm speaking about the spouses here, uh, whose shoes come off immediately upon arriving home. Sometimes they're off before they get across the uh, threshold, where mine stay on for a long time, and, and it's, it's, it looks like, why are, why, are your, why are your shoes still on? Not too many weeks ago, that person, my wife, <laughs> stubbed her toe real bad on a piece of furniture. And after the hurt and hollering went away, I said, see if you'd had shoes on, your toes would have been protected. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Our passage that we're working through this morning are uh, parts of that spiritual armor. And if you notice, as we are working through this passage, and we've heard it repeatedly each week, we are not to put on just the components that we deem necessary. We are instructed to put on the whole armor of God. In other words, God uses this analogy, this metaphor, to see that it all works together. It all represents the same truth. And this morning, we come to gospel boots. We looked at the belt of truth. We looked at the breastplate of righteousness. And now he commands us uh, in, in, in accordance with what we've been working on. Notice way back in verse at the beginning. Put, um, maybe down on the game just a touch. Or maybe it's just my mic cord. It's probably my mic cord, isn't it? Yep. Love technology. The beginning of this instruction, though, notice back there, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand on the evil day, having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on, and then he goes on to list all these different components. Stand occurs three times in that instruction. And of course, footing is a big part. Having good footing is a big part of being able to take a firm stance. It is a vital piece of equipment if the soldier is going to be able uh, to battle and withstand an attack. Um, firm footing is, abs is absolutely necessary and for a number of reasons. For a number of reasons. Uh, can, you, can you imagine a piece of equipment working the way it's supposed to without having an issue? Yep. I can. <laughs> It'll happen in heaven. <laughs> but think about that. Think about being in, and you have to remember, at the, especially at this time, in ancient days, most battles were fought hand to hand, or at least sword to hand, very close proximity. There was a lot of, of in touch. And can you imagine having your feet come out from underneath you in the midst of one of those battles? Uh, I thought about this issue of footing, and of course, uh, you know, I thought about one of the greatest gifts God ever gave humanity, baseball. Um, and I thought back to a time in a high school game when we were on a road trip, to, on a road game, and uh, our shortstop forgot his shoes. He had to play several innings of the game with just his regular sneakers on. And let me tell you, I was a catcher. It was interesting to see him try and field the balls. Because as he moved from side to side, he was constantly slipping, unable to plant his feet firmly and make a proper throw. In fact, as you are a baseball player, you find that you start as a little guy, you, you just get cleats. And then one day, you know, then you're a really big guy when you make it to high school and you get to put on a pair of spikes for the first time. Metal spikes. 
And you find out, especially if you're an infielder, how wonderful those spikes were, how well they work. And you know, one of the things that the Roman army was the very first to do in the world that made such a difference for them is they were one of the first armies to equip their soldiers, not just with, with sandals, we would think of more as sandals, uh, that strapped all the way up onto their uh, higher parts of their ankle in order to keep them firmly in place. But also they were one of the first armies to put metal studs on the bottom of those sandals to give them a firm footing in combat. That is turned out to be a great advantage. A great advantage. Think about how that firm foundation prepares you to do whatever you need to do, to perform whatever maneuver you need. It's the same kind of thing that the, the gospel here is being used at. The gospel provides us with an absolute firm footing, keeps us grounded, as we say, makes it possible for us to be able to move, to be able to fend off an attack with firm footing. That's the analogy that he's wanting us to consider. But he not only is telling us that we need to stand firm with this gospel, but he also, did you notice how he describes it there in the text Uh, Verse 15, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. The readiness. Always willing. Always ready. You know, um, I grew up with a fireman in the family. And um, the firemen have to be ready all the time. Uh, In fact, sleep-wise, now I don't know, Pat Gabler, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but they would keep their boots inside their turnouts. Are they still called turnouts? Okay. I want to make sure I wasn't using ancient language. So that they could step right in them, ready to go. See, the gospel gives you and I a readiness, not only to fend off attacks, attacks like this. Well, who do you think you are? I, I mean, the, the enemy comes and says things I know about you in ways other people don't. You're just a hypocrite. You don't belong. Where the readiness of the gospel that we need to often preach to ourselves is the gospel is not I saved myself. The gospel is Jesus saved me. The gospel is, I didn't make myself acceptable to God. Jesus made me acceptable to God. There's always that readiness to know the truth, to to have the belt of truth ready to go, the breastplate of righteousness in place, to remind ourselves of the truth. And why is it so familiar, or so important rather, to be able to preach it to ourselves? Because it then gives us the readiness to preach the gospel to others. To be able to say, now wait a minute, the gospel is for you just as as much it is for me. There is that sense where you want to be able to be ready to, to proclaim the truth, to proclaim the good news. Because that's exactly what the gospel is. It is good news of which we are heralds. Did you listen to the... Um, Words that we sang in our opening song. It's based on Isaiah 52, 7, which reads, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. A herald. Uh, in, in Isaiah 52, 7, it's the only other place in all of the Bible where gospel, 
feet and peace are used together. And as we've commented on before, and I repeat to you again, it is not primarily the Roman soldier that Paul has in mind, although he clearly has that. But primarily it is God as the divine warrior who has won our salvation for us that he has in mind. All those Old Testament scriptures predicting the ministry of the Messiah and the wonderful work that he would accomplish. And Isaiah 52, 7 talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Heralds, you know what the job of a herald is? You know, in Christmas time, we talk about herald angels. Heralds proclaim a message. Heralds are not salesmen or salespeople. Heralds are proclaiming a message. It's one of the things that has been a, a, a difficulty for the church throughout its lifetime. The gospel is not something we're trying to, swell, trying to sell. We are not trying to um, convince people, although convincing may be involved in it. We are proclaiming the king's message, the good news from the king. And heralds have no authority to change the king's message, to make it more palatable, to make it more relevant to the whims and fads of the day. Heralds merely proclaim the message. I uh, went to a um, conference. Well, it was kind of a conference many, many years ago. Never went back after the first one. And one of the things that was being discussed was, and the now, title of the conference was, uh, and I don't remember, it was a long title, but something about effective ministry in the 20th century. And it talked about how our preaching needs to adapt itself to the norms of the day. I'm, I was okay with them then. And then it went on to talk about how we needed to modify the gospel to appeal to the sensibilities of modern mankind. And the speaker went on to say that modern mankind doesn't believe in bloody sacrifices and substitutionary requirements and a God who needs to be satisfied. I got up and walked out of the conference. Not that anybody's ever gotten up and walked out of one of my sermons. That's never happened before, ever. But I got and walked up because I realized this was not the place for me. This conference was not what I thought it was. You see, I'm always amazed that the church thinks that it can do a better job than Jesus. Jesus didn't convert everybody who heard the message from him, did he? And I guarantee you, he was a... 10 hundred million times better preacher than I am. You see, the message will fall on all ears, but many ears will reject the message. It's the nature of how God has and governs this world. You see, the good news starts with bad news. I remember a time out in, when I was still playing golf many years ago, where my partner and I got paired up with another couple of guys to be a, make a foursome to be, two people we'd never met before. And uh, my partner decided it was time to be a herald and proclaim the good news. Totally appropriate. And one of the interesting things through that 18 holes, it didn't take 18 holes to come to a conclusion, was that he kept emphasizing how much Jesus loved him. And the guy kind of entertained and went back and forth with my friend a little while. But finally he had had enough, and I remember he looked right over at my friend and said, hey pal, I hear you, but if Jesus loves me, what's the problem? If he loves me, everything's going to be okay, right? And it dawned on my partner that he had only been focusing 
the herald on one part of the message. You see, for there to be, you, you all have studied, many of you have studied with me for a lot of years. In order for there to be good news, there first has to be what? Bad news. Bad news. So someone may say, well, how do I get these gospel shoes? It's as easy as A, B, C. A, admit there's a problem. Here's the bad news. The God who created all things, sustains all things, and reigns on high is holy, 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 and you are not. You are a corrupt sinner. There is a problem. There's a problem. Yes, Jesus loves you. But part of the love is to admit that there is a great need, a great chasm that you cannot cross on your own. You can't make yourself holy, holy, holy. Admit that there's a problem. And this is the part that causes all the difficulty. As I said in that earlier golf story, there's plenty of people that are more than willing to hear that Jesus loves them. What they don't want to hear is you have a sin problem that has separated you from God. And unattended will separate you from God forever. You see, that's the part of the gospel that nobody wants to hear. But it's an absolutely necessary precursor to get to the good news. So admit that there's a problem. B, believe in the heralded message that God sent his only son to live in your place, to live an obedient life you haven't lived, to die a death in your place to satisfy his justice, and that he was raised again to new life, a life that he gives to you, a life that is everlasting never to be separated from God again. There is a content of doctrine to believe. So admit there's a problem, believe the message, and see, come to Jesus. Come confessing that that is the only solution. And it's your solution. The one that you claim by faith. Matthew 11 records the words of our great Savior in the 28th verse. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The gospel is not a self-improvement program. I had the privilege this past week of officiating at some longtime friends of Tracy and I's. The father had passed away. And they asked me to officiate at the burial. And I was able to share at that time very briefly how sometimes even the church doesn't get the message right. Sometimes the church likes to stress all the rules. We like to sometimes confuse law and gospel and we bombard people with the law and make them feel like you've got to get your act together and then you can come to Jesus. When the Bible's message is actually the opposite. You won't ever even begin to be able to, be, to start getting your act together until you first come to Jesus. You know, that's the thing. I was able on that time to hold up the Bible and say, First and foremost, this book is a rescue story of how God rescues those he loves from a problem they can't fix. But sometimes the heralds don't get the good news right. Sometimes we confuse the law and the gospel. Sometimes we want to tell people all the, the great ways they can improve their life. Or, or sometimes we insert our own rules and say, you, you, you can only come to Jesus if you, these things are not true of you. As I look back at my younger years as a Christian, it was a great disappointment to me to realize 
how the grace of God was overshadowed by the peccadilloes of church leaders who inserted their own rules. I can think of, in one case, of, of, a, of a person who was kind of, I don't want to say kept away from church because, you know, it, it, they really want to go and hear the good news, but it became a discouraging thing all because the person was a smoker. And back in the 70s, that was a great sin. It's still a great sin. Gosh, if you look at the commercials, it's a bigger sin to smoke than it is to have an abortion, but that's a different, that's a different time, different sermon. But, but in other words, get rid of that, and then we'll see that you're serious about coming to the gospel. No. If I could go back and ask some of those people, why in the world did you do it that way? I would probably be a rather snarky and a little rude. I would want to ask them, what were you worried about? That God may say somebody of whom you don't approve? You see, the gospel starts out with us being able to stand firm in the truth that we must first remind ourselves that we are no better and no more deserving than anybody that we might preach the gospel to. Then we're in the readiness of the gospel. Then we understand. And friends... We need to remind ourselves, there isn't a single day that goes by that you and I don't need a Savior. Every single day. Then we're ready. Then we're ready. In fact, I, there's an old song, as I look back on that time, it was very popular back then. I think it was a Gaither song. I'm so glad that I'm a part of the family of God. And I always thought to myself, I wish they would sing it more how they mean it, which is, I'm surprised that you're a part of the family of God. We can get that way, can't we? We can get to the point to where we think we're better than. As D.T. Niles, a British evangelist, said many years ago, ultimately when it comes to the root of evangelism, all it is is one beggar telling another beggar where the bread is. And those gospel boots and that truth about how wonderful and amazing God's grace is in our lives, then prepares us to take it out to the world and to our friends and neighbors. Gospel boots are not given to us so that we can run from every difficulty, but so that we can stand firm in the midst of difficulty and stand firm against the attacks against God's truth and stand firm against a world that's ever increasingly clenching its fist and shaking it at God's truth. That's what gospel boots are for. You know, the word for gospel in the Greek is uh, euangelion, and I'm sure that that will stay with you for weeks and weeks. And the interesting thing about that word is that it has a lot of uses prior to the Gospels being written. One of the uses that Evangelion was used for is news from the front, news from the battlefield. News from the battlefield. How's it going out there? You know, you forget in a war, you have two or three sides or whatever it is fighting at each other. They're not just fighting for themselves, they're fighting for all their people, aren't they? And so the people have an interest in how the battle is going. What's the news? And one of the ways that word was used was for the watchman of a city looking for the runner. You know, you think of Marathon. Running back to tell the town the news of how the battle is going. With the hopes that he shows up and the good news is we've won. Victory is ours. We've won. I always think about the gospel being and how it was proclaimed and foreshadowed in all of the Old Testament. And one of those places that's a favorite when it comes to this is in the story of David and Goliath. Did you know that that's a gospel story? It is. It's a gospel story where an entire group of people 
are pinned down, are helpless to defeat a great enemy that they cannot do anything about. And God sends the most unimpressive candidate in the eyes of the world, much like our Savior, to defeat a giant of an enemy that the people had no hopes of defeating on their own. And I can almost picture a depressed group of sinners that can't get good enough seeing a herald come from Calvary with the news that we've won. Our champion has defeated this great giant enemy that we couldn't hope to take on ourselves. That's the good news. That's gospel readiness. That's standing firm. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word to us and this great reminder that the gospel is all about you. We are merely receivers of a wonderful truth that you in your wonderful and, and great mercy and love for us have defeated the enemy that we could never defeat our own, sin and death. And that in Christ we have a victory and we have a new life that lasts forever. May uh, we always be heralds of that message, not in a way that proclaims our superiority, but in our equal need of the only human being that was truly superior, Jesus, our Savior. May that truth, may those gospel boots keep us firmly grounded in our life serving you. In Christ's name, amen. If you're able, will you stand with me, please, and take your bulletin again. And there printed on the back page is our closing hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other My 
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. And now, may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with and among you, both now and forever. Go from this place and love one another, even as God in Christ has loved you. Amen.